Hi, I'm Roger Ains and I lead the Director's Carbon Initiative here at Livermore. Detailed studies of our options to keep the planet livable tell us that the climate technologies the world is currently focused on, renewables and electrification, won't be enough. We will need to actively clean up the atmosphere and that's a huge challenge, one that Livermore is poised to take on. Let's look at what we're up against. This is the trajectory of carbon emissions we'll follow if we continue our current activities. It will have devastating results for temperature and climate. Our ambition to keep temperature increase below 2 degrees C requires this red trajectory of worldwide carbon emissions. The models tell us that it will give us about a 66% chance of staying below 2 degrees C. Of course, 1.5 degrees C would be much harder. But the range of current tools available renewables, electrification of transportation, efficiency, carbon capture and storage, basically eliminating almost all fossil fuel emissions will only give us this reduction shown in brown. It's not enough. Why? It's mainly because of other greenhouse gases like methane, but partially because some CO2 is going to be really hard to remove from the economy, such as airplane fuel. It will be very difficult to eliminate all emissions. Agriculture is a particularly thorny case. For instance, nitrous oxide is emitted from fertilizer use, and of course, cattle emit methane. Are we going to stop using fertilizer and eating meat? And it's worse than that. We've already put so much CO2 in the air that we would need negative emissions, shown here in blue, even if we could get our current emissions to zero, which we can't. And the sum of the two is large. 10 billion tons by 2050, 20 billion tons by 2100. That green wedge, the required negative emissions, is as big a challenge as full electrification will be. It means that between now and 2050, we need to create an industry to clean up the atmosphere that moves twice as much material as today's oil industry. We need to have a billion tons of that operating in just 2030, just 12 years from now. So what exactly are we going to do? We have to find the right technologies and then quickly get them to scale. We have to create technology that can address negative emissions, but also understand how full-scale negative emissions ecosystems, capture, transportation, and storage can be created. We need to catch billions of tons of CO2 at an affordable price. And a really important aspect is how we encourage and enable the creation of businesses that do this job. You don't move billions of tons of anything without businesses that make money. We found three areas where Livermore strengths can best address this problem. Recycling CO2 into carbon products such as ethylene, led by Eric Duos and Sarah Baker. Encouraging the uptake of carbon dioxide by soils, led by Jennifer Petridge. And developing system approaches to this massive problem, led by George Paredes, who we recently hired away from the Natural Resources Defense Council to lead the development of carbon capture and storage projects here. Let me expand on those three areas. Major corporations like the French oil company Total and Shell are focused on how to make today's carbon products but without using petroleum. We are using additive manufacturing to take university design catalysts and build them into advanced reactors that can achieve the flux and energy density up to one amp per square centimeter required to help companies like Shell replace plants such as this one in Qatar with factories that will use renewable electricity and carbon dioxide to make the same products. We're the middlemen between pure academic catalysis research and industrial scale application. There are many academic programs in this area, so we have a ripe field of collaborators to bring us great catalytic materials to build into our reactors. Tom Jaramillo at Stanford University has been a key collaborator. Next, we're also looking at the huge target represented by the loss of soil carbon from agricultural practices, worldwide equivalent to almost 500 billion tons of carbon dioxide. We're focused on understanding how native, deeply rooted species like prairie grasses move carbon up to four meters deep into soils, which is how the great soils of the American Plains were formed. There's no other target that we know of that's this big for negative emissions, but it's also probably the hardest scientifically. The issue is not whether we can come up with better practices, but whether they'll be fast enough to matter. Finally, on the system side, we're focused on implementation issues and removing the barriers to large-scale progress. We need to accumulate and store massive amounts of CO2 underground. About half of the 10 to 20 billion tons I mentioned will have to go 3,000 feet deep into rocks like oil reservoirs. This will use the same technology and expertise as today's oil industry. 
The U.S. has already put 14 million tons permanently underground in demonstration programs run by the Office of Fossil Energy. Here at Livermore, we've been central to this work since its inception 20 years ago. We know this will work. Here in California, a big part of the picture is using the people and facilities that already exist to do the job. The potential loss of 100,000 great jobs in California Central Valley's oil industry has been a good way to open discussions with state government. We're working hard to get projects running here because the state's low carbon fuel standard can pay for the carbon storage that reduces the overall carbon footprint of transportation fuels. And the current price of $190 per ton of carbon dioxide is more than enough to make this a viable business. Changes this last January to the low carbon fuel standard make carbon capture and storage in any fuel chain applicable. We're partnering with the California oil industry and carbon dioxide producers, especially ethanol plants, to develop the first full-scale commercial injection project. Of course, it's Livermore, so we're starting with internal investments in the science it'll take to achieve these goals. And I'd like to highlight those projects. Eric Duas and Sarah Baker lead our biggest investment, a $3.5 million strategic initiative creating the additively manufactured reactors to ultimately turn CO2 into ethylene. The challenge here is to keep the environment just right for the catalyst, all while moving as much reactant and product as possible and working with very large electrical currents. We're starting a cooperative research and development agreement with Total and Stanford in this area, jointly developing models of electrical chemical reactors. Moving out of flatland and making these reactors three-dimensional is important. So, coating inexpensive conductive materials, such as carbon, with the catalysts is very important because copper is just too expensive at this scale. Additive manufacturing is perfect for this task. We're using it to make everything from 3D catalyst structures to the flow systems that channel the products and reactants. Feng Chan is investigating another approach, using live microorganisms printed into similar reactors. The goal is to take gases like carbon dioxide and methane and turn them directly into valuable chemicals like lactic acid, which was our first successful example of doing this. We're partnered with the National Re Renewable Energy Lab on this work. They make the bugs, we make the reactor. The ease with which they can make new microbes that produce specific chemicals is stunning. Only a few months are required. A surprising result is that the bacteria are often more productive in the printed gel than they are in the dilute suspensions that are typically used. On soils, Aaron Nuccio leads a project investigating the microbial ecosystems responsible for deep soil carbon. Perennial plants, in particular, put down deep roots that exchange chemicals with soil microbes, and the net effect is an increase in soil carbon. This is good for soil health and great for storing atmospheric carbon deep underground. Deep rooting crops have the potential to add significant amount of carbon back into soil, but we don't yet have the science to predict exactly what those gains would be. The ecosystem of plant roots, microbes, viruses that prey on microbes, and soil minerals that trap soil carbon is very complicated, and the carbon is always in flux. It's a stock and flow problem. Aaron is sampling switchgrass sites and comparing them to nearby annual grass plots across the eastern U.S. and Midwest to develop a predictive model. We'll use that model to understand carbon stocks nationally using our capabilities in radiocarbon and isotope analysis. When we started the Carbon Initiative, we expected it was going to be a pretty quiet four years for us, but it's been the opposite. In addition to these internal investments, we're now executing about $16 million of outside sponsor work this year across the applied DOE offices, Fossil Energy and EERE, the Office of Science and Industrial Partners. About half of that evolved from our previous efforts in carbon capture and soil microbiology. But the important point is that the sponsors are eager to do this work today. Negative emissions is a hot topic. We're working with both the Bioenergy Technology Office and the Fossil Energy Program to help them plan their work in carbon recycling and direct air capture. We're also hiring the best of the best. Here are the 17 new staff, postdocs, and postdoc conversions who support the Carbon Initiative. These bright young people are inspired to keep our planet livable. I'm delighted with the talent we're attracting to the lab. I have to tell you, I have a very fun job watching these scientists start to change the world. A vital question for negative emissions is, where will the carbon dioxide come from? We're building on our innovative carbon capture program, originally designed for power plants, but now expanding into capture systems for biofuel production, such as the anaerobic digesters that currently make methane mixed with carbon dioxide. 
In fact, most biofuel production releases a molecule of carbon dioxide for every molecule that goes into the fuel. We can catch that carbon dioxide and store it underground for negative emissions. Jenny Knight is using this printed carbon dioxide absorbing fabric to purify biogas in a project funded by the DOE commercialization efforts. We're now applying all of this to the first economy-wide study of negative emissions for California. California's emissions are plotted here at roughly the same size to show the same state of progress as world emissions. California has begun re reducing our emissions and has a law calling for 50% reduction by 2030 and an executive order calling for net zero by 2045, which is much more aggressive than the world goal I showed previously. We estimate that California's equivalent amount of negative emissions will be more than 100 million tons in order to hit the net neutral point shown in this graph by 2045. The Hewlett Foundation has funded Livermore to outline the mix of negative emissions technologies including biofuel with carbon capture, soil carbon, recycling of CO2, and direct removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere that will be needed to achieve this goal. The analysis will include estimated costs for biomass supply, transportation of biomass and carbon dioxide, and the development of storage sites around the state. 30 million tons of forest biomass from logging and fire clearing work will be central to that analysis, as will the development of direct air capture sites. In conclusion, the big questions are, can we find enough ways to clean up the atmosphere? And when we know what they are, can we speed up their implementation? We think negative emissions are feasible, and the sponsor community is interested in making this into reality, but it's gonna be a really heavy lift. We're just at the beginning now, rather like renewable energy in the 1970s. Deploying negative emissions at scale will be one of the great challenges of this century, and we're proud to be leaders in this work.